Isaiah 55, verse 6 and 7. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts, and let him return to the Lord. And he will have compassion on him, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. This week and next, we're going to look at people who actually had wonderful, well, almost face-to-face -face encounters with God. By that, I don't mean face-to-face, -face because we know you can't look on God's face. But the one-on-one -on -one experience with a living God. One of those was our wonderful friend Moses. You know I love Moses. <laughs> Moses is one of them fellas that... He really knew God for 40 years of his life. And he complained when he first got to know him, when he saw that burning bush. And, he was tell, and God was telling Moses, I got this job for you to do. And Moses is like, but, 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 but. I can't, I can't, I can't. And God at every turn said, I will do this, I will do that. You can. <laughs> For someone who caught up there and told God, I am not very a very good speaker, uh, I, I just can't do this, and I'll tell you what, through the rest of his 40 years of dealing with God and talking with God, he sure says some things that I'm not sure any of us would actually talk to God that way, either from us being a little on the, the timid side or, or whatever. Now, like I said, I won't say this was a face-to-face -face meeting with God, uh, because well, God said to Moses that if he saw God's face, that would lead to a minor problem because Moses would be dead. <laughs> and God's not ready for Moses to be dead. He has more for him to do. But it was a very, very close encounter nonetheless. Now, we're going to start uh, this experience to, and it's going to teach us a little bit more about the God that we serve. And we're going to pick up the story halfway through a conversation between Moses and the Lord. Now, we'll set up a little background here. Moses had already been up on the mountain. Joshua's been halfway up on the mountain. And God's given Moses that God wrote the Ten Commandments with his finger. And he tells Moses, you better get back down to the camp because your people... Notice, not my people, your people are not doing what they are supposed to be doing. And he meets Joshua halfway down, and Joshua says, sounds like there's a battle taking place. And Moses says, no, this is a sound of joy and celebration and singing. So he goes down, and Moses breaks the commandments, burns up the idol, the golden calf, and makes him drink of the ashes or the the, the, the dregs of it they have a whole bunch of other things that take place and Moses goes and he tells the people you have really disappointed God and they can hear God talking and Moses goes into the tent of meeting and everybody comes out and they stare at the tent while he's in there and they stay there all day God comes down in a cloud to the tent and when God goes up and Moses comes out the people wait to hear what he says well, Moses is told a whole bunch of good things by God, like, you know what, because you people are obstinate and you're stubborn and all these other things, I ain't going with you. You go on, you go on and move down into, into the land of milk and honey, I'll send an angel. I'll let an angel lead you. You know, I, I, I love you, but I'm liable to kill you before you get there. <laughs> and this is the conversation that Moses is having with God. So they're going to look at Exodus 30 through 33, verses 12 through 30, or 12 through 23. Now I knew that 33s and 23s, too many threes in this. Then Moses said to the Lord, See, you say to me, Bring up this people, but you yourself have not let me know whom you will send with me. Moreover, you have said, I have known you by name. And you have also found favor in my sight. Now, therefore, I pray you, if I have found favor in your sight, let me know your ways that I may know you, so that I may find favor in your sight. 
Consider, too, that this nation is your people. And he said, My presence shall go with you, and I will give you rest. Then he said to him, If your presence does not go with us, do not lead us up from here. For how then can it be known that I have found favor in your sight, I and your people? Is it not by your going with us so that we, I and your people, may be distinguished from all the other people who are upon the face of the earth? The Lord said to Moses, I will also do this thing which you have spoken. For you have found favor in my sight, and I have known you by name. Then Moses said, I pray you, show me your glory. And he said, I myself will make all my goodness pass before you and will proclaim the name of the Lord before you. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and I will show compassion on whom I will show compassion. But he said, you cannot see my face for no man can see me and live. Then the Lord said, behold, there is a place by me, and you shall stand there on the rock, and it will come about while my glory is passing by that I will put you in the cleft of the rock and cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will take my hand away, and you shall see my back, but not my face, uh, but, but my face shall not be seen. I'm telling you, the, the, this fellow Moses is pretty bold and brazen. Well, God, if I found all this favor, show me your glory. I want to see all of you. I want to be able to, I, I want to be able to know you as much as I feasibly possibly can. In the middle of this conversation about Moses leading the Israelites through the wilderness, Moses has a thought, and it's encouraged by the fact that the Lord has just said that he is pleased with him. I mean, Moses decides to take that chance. He wants to see God's glory. Do you want to see God's glory? Mm -hmm. Do you really? Mm -hmm. do. do you have the tenaciousness and audacity of Moses? Maybe not, but I still want to see it. <laughs> <laughs> Now, God knew exactly what Moses is asking. What exactly is the glory of God? The Hebrew word for glory is kabod and means honor, glory, majesty, and wealth. Previously, Moses had met God at the burning bush, which, while it was an interesting sight, didn't disclose the complete glory of God. He heard his voice. He talked with him. But there was something within Moses at this point in time that he desired to see God with his full glory revealed, or at least to the extent that he was allowed. This raises some questions for our own lives. Would you say that you are someone that desires to know more about God's glory and character? Do you pray that God would reveal more of himself to you? Do you think that if you ask, and see, we, we, you know, we just got through watching, uh, oh, what was that, that movie with Jack Nicholson? And a Few Good Men. A Few Good Men. And, and, uh, and it kind of reminds me, do you pray that if you ask with the right motives that God will grant that request? Or do you think that God would be like Jack Nicholson? I will show you this, but you got to ask me nicely. <laughs> you have to ask me earnestly. You know, we serve a great and wonderful and powerful God. And it says that he loves us. And I really don't think that there's nothing that God wouldn't do for us if we ask with the proper motives. I don't think God would be like Jack Nicholson and do that. At least I would really hope not. Because that would make us question ourselves some, you know, really severely. So how did God respond to Moses when he said, I would, if, if I'm all this to you, 
I want to see all your glory. God seemed pleased by the request. He seemed pleased because, well, he said that I'll pass by. I will pass by and show his goodness to Moses. But this is going to be far more than a lightning and effects display. I told Amy, I said it was really interesting, I, you know, and I highlighted it in here, that I cannot count the number of times that I have read this passage, and it's like a lot of things. You read it, and you read it, and you read it, and you go, yeah, 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 that, you know, God said this, God said he's going to do this. But it finally sank in that God told him that I, there's this cleft right here by me. You're going to stand on the rock, and as I go by, I will put you in the, the cleft. God picked him up with his hand and put him in the cleft and kept his hand there until he went by. That really struck me this week. It was like all this time of reading this. And it never sank in. What would it feel like to have God pick you up in his hand? We do know that, as we read on here in a little bit more, that Moses ended up bowing and worshiping. We know that Moses is up on that mountain. And I, 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 and I really honestly think that it was at this point in time when God picked him up and put him in the cleft and held the hand there. And when he walked by and the hand was pulled, I think it's here that Moses glowed. He shone bright. And I have a hard time thinking that here I would be. God, I want to see your glory. I would like to see your goodness. I would like to feel your hand. Pick me up and put me somewhere so that I can listen to you walk by and hear your declaration and see you from behind. All that tremendous light to see your goodness. I might have to rip off all my clothes. I wouldn't want the, the rags covering God's light. If I'd have thought I was going to do that, I'd have grabbed me some Kleenex. But God did it for him. God said, I will do this for you. He knew that Moses was earnest. He was honest. He had no ulterior motive other than to get to know God better. And that's the important bit. This is what we really need to know. So we see that the glory of God is related to the goodness of his character. God is good, not partially good, and not and uh, not part uh, not partially good or partially not good. God is good all the time. All of His attributes are perfect and good. All of His attributes work together. Moses saw all His attributes when he saw all the. His glory, His goodness walk by. We see also that the Lord would also proclaim His name, Yahweh, to Moses. That is, Moses could learn about God's glory through God's name as well. God would reveal to Moses His self-sufficient, eternal, unchanging nature through the meaning, through the meaning of His name. <sighs> But note that Moses could not see God's face. 
And I really believe that Moses was content with that. I'm sure that we would be content. William MacDonald in the Believer's Bible Commentary writes, No one can see God's face and live. This means that no one can look upon the unveiled glory of God. 1 Timothy 6.16b, He dwells in unapproachable light, whom no man has seen or can see. And in that sense, no one has seen God at any time. 1 John, according to 1 John 4.12. Well, if that's true, how then do we explain passages in the Bible where it talks about where people saw God and did not die? Some examples. Hagar, Jacob, Moses, Aaron, Nadab, Abihu, uh, 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 and the 70 elders when they went up to have the meal with God and they saw the feet, the glass sea, the sapphire look, and they partied. They didn't die. We have the uh, Gideon, Isaiah, and Ezekiel. Well, heck, even John himself while on the island of Patmos. He saw God in the vision. Well, the answer is that these people saw God as represented by the Lord Jesus Christ. Sometimes he appeared as an angel of the Lord, sometimes as a man. We know that God even does his stuff through voice. And we know this from John 1.18. The only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father has fully declared God. And in Hebrews 1.3a, 1, uh, 1, and he is the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his nature and upholds all things by the word of his power. That is why he could say who... He who has seen me has seen the Father. Isn't that what Jesus told them? Mm -hmm. What are you asking me? You've seen me. We have an example of God's glory in the splendor of our own sun. Our sun, Earth's closest star, gives light to our world. It literally is the light to this world. No sun, no light. Just as it is no sun, no light. Looking straight at the sun without protection can damage the retina, even cause blindness. It is simply too powerful, too radiant. In a manner, no one can look right at the glory of God and live. But God provides a rock, and from there Moses will be allowed to view the Lord as he passes by. As believers, we have been placed in the cleft of, of the rock also. The rock is Jesus. He is the rock that we both stand in and on, allowing us to see the glory of God. It is the only place that mankind can see the glory of God. And when Jesus returns, believers shall be allowed to see him face to face. For we will have been changed in an instant into his likeness. Our good old friend A.Z. Tozer writes well about our position in the cleft of the rock. You know, I've really gotten to where I really appreciate that dude. <laughs> He's really kind of, the stuff that he wrote is really so deep and so profound that it's really good. He says, we must, like Moses, cover ourselves with faith and humility while we steal a quick look at God whom no one, who no, whom no man can see and live. The broken and the contrite heart, he will not despise. We must hide our holiness, or our unholiness, in the wounds of Christ as Moses hid himself in the cleft of the rock while the glory of God passed by. We must take refuge from God in God. Above all, we must believe that God sees us perfect in his Son while he disciplines and chastens and purges us that we may be partakers of his holiness. We take refuge in Him to see Him. Exodus 34, 5-8 tells us, The Lord descended in the cloud and stood there with Him as He called upon the name of the Lord. And then the Lord passed by in front of Him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in loving kindness and truth, 
who keeps loving kindness for thousands, who forgives iniquity, transgression, and sin. Yet he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished, visiting the iniquity of fathers on the children and on the grandchildren to the third and fourth generations. Moses made haste to bow low toward the earth and worship. I can envision as God's going by and saying this, that the thunder coming out of his mouth is shaking the mountain. I just don't think that Moses is the only one that possibly heard. These people, they know. Joshua knows. And Moses spent a considerable amount of time on that mountain with God after the Israelites made that golden calf. He went back up on that mountain uh, after Moses broke that original sep, uh, uh, tablets, to be precise, and in Exodus 34, 28, it tells us, so he was there with the Lord 40 days and 40 nights. He did not eat bread nor drink water. And he wrote on the tablets the words of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. God told him when he was up there, cut yourself another set of tablets and write the words that I tell you. God didn't write them for him the second time. During this time, there was a transformation that took place. And like I said, I, my guess is that that transformation is when God picked him up and put him in the cleft. He was enclosed by God's hand. <coughs> and that is the one thing that, I, I, like I said, I never paid that much attention to. But it really brought a reality home. How much do I really want to know God? I want to know him more and more and more. I want to be faithful. I want to be obedient. I want to turn to God and say, I want to know you. I want to know all of you. We know that Moses, when he came down the mountain, he was glowing. Tells us in Exodus 34, 35, the children of Israel saw the face of Moses, that the skin of Moses' his face shone, and Moses put the veil upon his face again until he went in to speak with him. What do we learn about God from what was revealed to Moses? Well, his name is Yahweh. It is often pronounced that, or Je Jehovah. And this has the central thought of being the self-existent, eternal God. But also righteous and just. And we see that this encounter had a great impact upon Moses. And there are several points that we can take away for our own lives. When looking at the impact of Moses' encounter with God, we can see that it produced the following. Humility. Moses humbled himself. He took it, uh, his rightful place, when in the presence of the Almighty God. He worshipped. Moses worshipped when God went by, and after he made his proclamation, Moses hit the deck and started worshipping. And this is the first mention of Moses ever worshipping. Anytime you see something of the majesty and character of God, you must worship. You don't really have a choice because, oh my gosh, look at how great and grandeur and majestic our God is. Worship is our response to the glory of God. The supernatural, Moses, he had no food and drink for 40 days and 40 nights. Now, you can go 40 days without food, but you can't go too much, you know, a whole lot, you know, very long without water. But the essentials of this life are no longer seen as essential when you're in God's presence like that. By extension, it is God's presence within our lives that lifts us above the normal fleshly reactions and desires. It teaches others, we read above, that Moses wrote what he has seen and heard. In other words, he wants to help others and give to them the word of God. Isn't that what we're told to do? pass on what we've seen and what we know. 
Moses was changed. You cannot be in the presence of God and not be changed. You cannot accept Christ and follow Christ and not be changed. It's impossible. Moses shone with the glory of God. He was changed. People could see that there was something different about Moses and that the difference had to be God. So is, show me your glory, a prayer for today? I really hope that it is. I would love to be able to be up here in the service and start service and have the Shekinah glory come in to this building. Make us all pass out on the floor for a while and wake up with a heavenly sleep, a heavenly rest. I can guarantee you no child would ever enter this school again and misbehave. We might even hear demons run screaming as the children approach the school. We may not see the outward manifestation of the Shekinah glory, but the prayer to see the glory of God is still valid in regard to God's goodness, His grace, His character and nature. The Bible says that as we behold Jesus' glory, we are changed into that very glory. We'll end the day with a, just a few key scriptures, uh, uh, quotes from Scripture in the New Testament concern, concerning the glory of Jesus today. They are all worthy of our thought and our meditation. John 1.14, The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We have seen His glory, the glory of the One and Only who came from the Father full of grace and truth. God is, has come close to you in Jesus Christ. You don't have to struggle to find Him and continue to search. More commonly, be people that do that, they stay close to the place until God draws near to them, then they quickly move on. However, God literally came to us in the flesh and lived among us. I really believe that even though we may not have had the opportunity to see Christ face to face, we know from what we read that he was full of grace and truth. And I can look around the room today and I can see Christ's face in all of us. I think others can see when we're reflecting Christ, they can see Christ's face. And when we are not necessarily, they can see a dull image. 2 Corinthians 3, 7 through 9. Now, if the ministry that brought death, which has engraved in letters on stone, came with glory, so that the Israelites could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of its glory, fading though it was, will not the ministry of the Spirit be even more glorious? If the ministry that condemns men is glorious, how much more glorious is the ministry that brings righteousness? And that's what people see when we reflect Christ, when we, when we show the attributes that God has given us as believers. 2 Corinthians 3.18 But we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as from the Lord the Spirit. And finally, the last scripture for the morning, 2 Corinthians 4, verses 5 and 6. For we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus as Lord, and ourselves as your bondservants for Jesus' sake. For God who said, light shall shine out of darkness, is the one who has shown in our hearts to give the light of, and of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. Go out this week. When you go shopping, when you get out there, have a good time. Play music. Dance around. Be yourselves. Show just who God is. Let people look at you and go, oh my God, these women are crazy. <laughs> and go, and if they say it out loud, say you're darn right. I got the spirit of the Lord flowing through me. 
Do you know him? You too could be crazy like us. And we will never change because we will not deny him. Let us just do that such a simple thing. And let us pray to God, Lord, let me see your goodness. Let me see your glory to its fullness. I want to glow. I want to glow. Let's go to prayer.